What's going on, guys? You are talking to the Road to Rip Pod. No, you're not talking to the Road to Rip Pod. You're listening to the Road to Rip Podcast. That is correct. Um, I have on Brad Pilon. We did a podcast recently. It was episode 102, 102. That's right. We're getting up there in the numbers. And we talked all about fat loss, getting lean, 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 why people struggle with their weight and all that. Um, that was episode 102. So now we're talking about muscle building, you know, what it takes to build muscle, um, how much muscle can you build, all that kind of stuff. So we're jumping right into the podcast right now. So buckle up and talk a little bit about training and muscle growth. And I know there's a lot of guys listening to this podcast um, that, you know, are determined to put on a good amount of muscle. And so, right. you know, one question a lot of us have is, you know, how big can I can I realistically get um, without using steroids, without using drugs? Um, because yeah. there's skewed perception because we look in the media, we see – some people in Hollywood, we see people um, on magazines and shows, and and some of which are you know huge, but it's outside the realm of what's achievable. Yeah, this is probably my favorite topic. I mean, like I, weight loss is fun, but I really like talking muscle building and what's possible. And I'm really happy over the recent months, actually, that a lot of Hollywood celebs have kind of come out being like, of course I, I choose for that role. What did you think? Right? A, a lot of you know, so it, it's really opening people's eyes to the fact like okay, maybe that wasn't a real expectation for myself. Was that Tom Hardy that came out? Or? Yeah, what did he say? He said, someone asked him, did you take steroids? And like, I, no, I took Skittles. Oh, yeah, what, what, the, what the F do you think I was taking, right? And um, Mickey Rourke, mm -hmm. right? And then you, you have sort of the obvious ones and the guys who, you know, uh, you know Sylvester Stallone and getting, you know, openly admitting he uses it. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's just helping out a lot. Right. So what you have is you have you you need to set a realistic example for yourself. So first, what do we have? Okay. Well, we have the heights and weights of professional athletes. All right. Well, anybody who has a friend who's actually a pro athlete knows that their their height and weight on their players' card is a lot different than what they actually are, and they fluctuate through a season. Right. And, and there's also a significant amount of drug use even in, in in those areas. And so that's not. It's not a good spot to start, but what it does show you uh, very clearly is that your amount of lean mass you can carry is directly related to your height, and that's cool because that's exactly what we see in military research. It's exactly what we see in anthropometric research. Um, it's exactly what we found. Uh, for you guys who don't know, I'm also involved in the Adonis and Venus products, and we have the the, the great privilege of just collecting a really nice amount of data on people in those products. So in the idea that weight gain and the weight loss and muscle building really relates to your height is also what we found there. So we have our own specific algorithms, but generally what we found is that I'll try to explain it without actually going through the entire equation. Your lean mass is related to just a bit more than the cube of your height. So it you know you as a tube. And for about to really, really generalize it down. For about every inch in height, you can expect about a seven inch, sorry, a seven pound change in lean body mass. So I'm 5'10. A person with my exact same frame, exact same build, who's six foot, would have about 14 pounds more lean mass than me. Mm -hmm. right. So then the other one, again, I'm generalizing. That's a, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a big difference. Oh, yeah, it's huge. Which explains, you know, when, um, when people talk about the six foot six or six foot seven pro athlete who can eat like 4,000 calories a day, you're sitting there going like, he has like tons more lean mass than you. And the important part there is that lean mass, everybody talks about the how many calories muscle burns, right? Well, muscle burns meh calories. The important thing is like your heart, your liver, your, your those internal organs. Right? Organ. Those organs are bigger in a six foot four person than they are in a five foot six person. And those so are more calories than the muscle tissue. Exactly, way more. So the, the, those metabolically active ones grow. So it's not like that seven pounds is just seven pounds of muscle. We can calculate it out to be roughly like an extra 40 cal calories of calorie burden, right? We're talking like an increase in the size of heart and liver and all those things that the work needed to pump a lot around a six foot six frame and all that kind of stuff. So it, that seven number is a good general thing. So when you're trying to compare you to your five foot six friend, right? And are you trying to figure out why you've got a buddy who's five six who just looks unbelievable at 145? Right, and you know it, that's because that's a great weight for him. Mm -hmm. Now the next thing is, is sort of your standard deviation. So just like height, 
you know, lean body mass tends to follow in a normal curve, right? With most of the population kind of falling right in the middle, then everybody kind of moving out in either direction from there. And I find this to stand deviations about seven pounds, right? Which means that most people are going to be within like a 28 pound range of lean body mass at the same height, mm -hmm. right? So the, most of the time, that guy who's like super, super jacked, and he's 180 and you're 170, right? It's like a 10 pound difference. And that's what, what kills me is when people talk about gaining like 20 pounds of muscle. And you're like, yeah, do you have any idea what that would look like? Like it's, it's, it's a monstrous amount of muscle, right? Like people can eat, even a 28 pound difference in lean mass at five foot 10, if you assume their heart, their liver, and all those things are roughly the same size, they're the same height, like that's, that's extraordinarily mm -hmm. massive changes. So, but there are outliers. So in height, six foot eight would be like a, an extreme outlier, extreme. But everybody knows one person who knows somebody who's six foot eight, right? Like you can kind of look back in your life and be like, oh, okay, yeah, the one guy in university, he was at least six eight. You know, e EB was close. He was probably six six. Like, he's got those friends. And if you're on a, like a professional basketball team, you know, at, like <laughs> like thirty people that are six foot eight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? But you know how rare it is because when you see a six foot eight dude walk through a mall, you're like, well, that dude's tall, right? Like it's, you know. So, but it, but it happens. So the same thing happens with lean mass, right? There is a five foot ten guy out there with 166 pounds of lean body mass who's never touched the drug. But here's the really important part. If you were that guy, you'd already know, right? Like you, you'd be like, geez, I'm, I'm jacked, right? Like I just naturally am big. Right, so that person exists, but chances are you're not him or he's not you, right? So you're working within this sort of standard range. Uh, so if you, and this is really important, is when you look at, and to give you a really clear idea of it, when you look at most research, especially the muscle gaining research or the protein intake research, <laughs> the, the lean mass of those guys is always like 135 pounds at 5'10". Mm. Like they're not... That's, that's average. They're not giants, right? So if you're 5'10 and you're pushing 150 pounds of lean mass, you've done really, really well. I mean, if you can hit, you know, 8 9% body fat while being even close to 170, you've done great. Right? Like that, that, is, that is very respectable for 5'10. Now, if you're 6'4 and 170, that's an issue, right? And if you're 5'4 and 170, then you've got some questions. You know, you're either a giant outlier or, or you, you might be on steroids, but it, if you just kind of take the idea of, let's give you a, a good number of 155 being a really, really good number for a 5 foot 10 guy who trains, who's natural, who isn't, you know, didn't used to be an NCAA cornerback type of thing, right? So you've got normal size legs, which is at least 50% of the muscle mass for a normal guy in the legs. Um, 155 would be great, so I'm going to actually reach for a calculator because I'm not lazy. Right, so then you just go up from that, right? So if at 70, 5 foot 10, 70 inches, 155 is great, and you're like, okay, but I'm, you know, 5 foot, sorry, I'm 6 foot 2, right? Well, then you can just simply take the, the 4 times 7, 28 pounds, and add it on to that. I'm, I'm totally using a calculator. And 183 is a good number, right? Like it, and you just kind of play with it that way. But the key is you don't get to grow forever. I mean, no one, with the exception of steroids, which is almost a, a linear relationship between your dose and the amount of muscle you gain. Nobody grows forever. In fact, when lean mass grows forever, that's a bad thing we call the tumor, right? So there is a some sort of muscle set point. I don't know if it's physiologic. I don't know if it's a survivalist thing, whereas, you know, the amount of work and strength it would take for you to grow beyond whatever you're at now um, your tendons or ligaments or, or previous injuries are preventing you from getting there. Mm. It could be genetic. Whatever the case may be, you're going to hit a limit. And that was a large part of um, our thought press process behind Adonis uh, because since the goal can't be just more muscle, right, because it, eventually that goal is just not feasible anymore, it has to become muscle in the right places, right? It has to become a, a measure of proportion and using your, let's call it a muscle allowance, properly, right? So if, if realistically you're only ever going to gain uh, 15 pounds in your lifetime, I'm just totally picking that number of a hat, 15 pounds in your lifetime, 
you know, would it be a good idea to drop all 15 pounds into your thighs and calves? Well, if you're a professional athlete, maybe it would be. Maybe that would be a great idea. Um, but if you just want to look good on the beach, maybe that's not such a good idea. Since most of your time, your thighs are covered up, right? So you kind of got to pick and choose with the allowance and, and make sure you're spending it on the places you want to spend it, right? And it, it's actually a bit of a theory as to, you know, people with, you know, struggling with a lagging body part. So it could be that, you know, you've kind of used up all the potential. But in general, you can't grow all the time. In general, that, that rule of sevens is a really easy thing to work with in terms of comparing you to other people at different heights. Um, and then the sort of standard deviation over by sevens also kind of gives you an idea of, you know, where you are relative to kind of everyone else. I mean, if I could give you a ballpark number, let's start at 510, that's almost kind of the middle range for most guys. Uh, I would say a, a trained guy, so not a well-trained, but a trained guy should fall somewhere in the 140s. Mm. Of lean body mass. Of lean body mass. So it's not that big, right? Like, I'm, I'm talking about a guy who's... He goes to the gym, maybe not really following a program, but it's been consistent, right? Maybe played sports in the past, but doesn't now. That kind of thing. And then you should be able to push it up. You know, you've got now you've got your standard deviation to work with. So, I mean, let's just pick 145, right? So then you can kind of go, okay, 152, and be like, wow, like 160 would be incredible. Then anything above that, like 166 type of thing, that would be like outlier. And I mean, to give you an idea, that would be someone who had like, 5'10", 184 is pushing sub 10% body fat, mm -hmm. which is impressive, right? So you just, you got to accept the fact that, you know, you don't just say you have to go, okay, well, 145 is a guy who trains. I'm special. I'm going to just keep adding seven to that, and I'm going to be like, you know, 170 pounds of lean mass, and, you know, I'm going to walk around at almost 190 to 10%, right? Like it, especially if you didn't start there. Mm -hmm. Now, if you started when you're like, I've always been – you know, 182 and, and have full abs and in vascular. Well, you know that's where you are, so you're going to probably gain from there. But if you're, you know, like me and you've got a wrist that's like six and a half inches maybe, so you're not overly big bone, I've never been dieted down, you know, in the 180s. Like I've always ended up in the, somewhere in the 170s. At 37, setting a goal for 190 without drugs just isn't really realistic. And I think a lot of it comes into the play if you accept that, and you accept the fact that you can look mind-blowingly good at, at, a, at a lower weight. We call it in the dawn as permission to be thin, right? If you get too hung up on hitting a weight, uh, you're really hurting your chances of ever being lean and kind of happy with your shape, right? Because you're too busy trying to be 198 as opposed to realizing that you would have been amazing at 174. And, and, and a proper 174 will look like 190 to most people because you've leanness adds muscle in a weird sort of way. Right. I mean, a good example is if you like look at some Hollywood movies like uh, Brad Pitt and Troy. He wasn't 200 pounds. No. He was maybe 175. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, you know, lots, lots of the games. And you can just about take any well-built lean guy, and people estimate his weight 10, 12 pounds heavier than he actually is, right? So, and you have to ask yourself, if you're in the gym, and I think a lot of this comes down to, um, we call it goal hijacking. Are you in the gym to look good, or are you in the gym to make a certain weight? If you're an athlete, you may have been actually trying to make a certain weight, but if you're in the gym to look good, right? You know, I, what if you look horrible at 200, but just amazing at 150, but you want to be 200, right? Like, it's, you've got to get rid of that and realize your, your goal was a look. Your goal was to be lean and muscular. And the weight, that's just a secondary thing. It's something maybe you track for progress, but setting your goals around the weight, well, then you're just you're, you're doing something completely different than trying to build a good-looking body. You're trying to just build a weight. Um, the, the guys are sometimes get this. Girls have a really hard time with this, is realizing that, like, because they, a lot of women like to just pick a 122, right? I want to weigh 122 pounds. And you can look at it and be like, well, you could look amazing at 135, but I could try to get you to 122, right? Like, it's it, forgetting that what you wanted to do was look great and, and not hit a certain weight. So when it comes down to how much weight you can gain, you know, it, it's not a giant number. I mean, yes, Hollywood actors miraculously seem to be able to gain 25 pounds, supposedly. I've never seen them step on a scale, and that's important. 
um, but look like they've gained 25 pounds for a movie role. But I've seen guys <laughs> look like they've gained 25 pounds and they gained 12, right? So it's, it's a big deal there. The other thing, and I think it was Ryan Reynolds who said this, was that the thing you have to remember about when they talk about how much weight he gains is that he works out for a movie role. And then when that's done, he doesn't work out. Like, he's not a gym rat, right? So, yeah, he totally gained 12 pounds for Blade, and then he gained 12 pounds for um, that one he did with Sandra Bullock, but it was same 12 pounds. The proposal, yeah. yeah oh, it's the proposal. 12 pounds, yeah. Yeah, and so he's, he's, the thing he said, and I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth, so, but another good Canadian boy, but uh, putting words in his mouth a bit, but what he said was that the only difference is he gets better at it. So it used to take him, like, 12 weeks to get ready for a movie, he can probably now do it in eight. Right, and if you do it in six, it'd be even better. But the important part is he's getting back to his best. It's not like he's twelve pounds over his blade weight, and then his next movie's to be twelve pounds over that. Right? Um, typically, actually, and, and and Chris Hemsworth and Thor is a great example. Is they almost always the first time they do it, that's their biggest, mm -hmm. and then they kind of shrink every movie after that. Right? <laughs> so, um, or they blow up, and we all know why. But it's uh. You know, they're just regaining it. So I think for the, the key message there is that that's what we want, right? We want you to learn how to be close to your ideal, right? Because not everybody stays at ideal all the time. But what we want you to know is how to get there as quickly as possible and to know when you're there and then I want to, and then tweak off of that, right? You, you can be 174 in, you know, at 10% body fat in July and 174 and 9% body fat in December, but you've specialized different muscle groups, and you can drastically change that look. And that's more what you get to when you're kind of, when you realize that you, maybe your muscle gaining days are behind you. Mm -hmm. Right, that's, um, that, that, that's a great point. So I like the whole concept of, uh, I mean, you, let's say you only have 15 pounds of muscle you can put on. Where do you want to put that? Are you going to do a very lower body dominant routine and have, your upper body look virtually the same with bigger legs and thighs. Most yep. guys, if they want to create that look, that's not what it's going to be. It's going to be adding muscle to like the upper chest. Yeah. And, arms. and there's important parts there too, right? Like I, I kind of laugh right now at the whole leg thing online, right? Like friends don't let friends skip leg days and pointing out people's small legs and, and all that kind of thing. And the issue is that something can only be small in your body in proportion to something else, right? So are your legs small for you or is it just your – did you make your upper body too large, especially in areas that don't count that much? So, you know, giant arms and giant chest, you know, it's actually affecting your posture, right? When it's actually, that's kind of putting off the look of your legs. Because it's all proportion, right? So um, that's a really important part, too, is when you follow some sort of traditional cookie-cutter plan, where you train every body part once a week for the same amount of sets and same amount of reps and everything's roughly the same, how are you actually changing your shape? You're, everything's getting bigger, right? But what if it was like you actually already had a, you know, you were good, naturally have a really good chest, and for some reason you've got a really chiseled back, but you've got like these 12 inch arms. Wouldn't you want to train arms more than those other two muscle groups more often and then maybe with more volume, right? Like if, and that's really when you start taking proportion in the idea of, okay, if I only had 15 pounds a game, if there is a finite limit eventually to how much muscle I'm going to add on this frame, where do I want it and why? And that's that's when you really start taking a pretty cool strategic approach to muscle building instead of the just, well, I'm just going to gain muscle until it's not possible to gain muscle anymore. Because we, anybody who's in their probably mid-30s, we've done that, right? Like you, in your 20s, you benched until you couldn't bench anymore. You blew out your shoulder. You rehab, you ice, you rehab, you, you spend hundreds on physio. What would you do? You went right back to benching. And you built yourself all the way back up to, you know, you have 365 on bench press and shoulder's gone again. Right, and you realize that the, the chase for just more strength, more muscle in one spot for no reason, it, it hits the point where it's, it's not your muscle, maybe even your, your growth factors in your body that are limiting you. It's the fact you've blown your shoulder up three times. Right, like it's rarely does a guy in his 40s and 50s tell you that he doesn't work out anymore just because he doesn't like it. He either got too busy with family, which is, you know, Neither here nor there. Or the injuries have accumulated to the point where it wasn't enjoyable. Right? So if you can just stay uninjured, the, the whole key to building muscle is to be consistent. And the key to being consistent is to mostly don't get injured. And then you're just building it where you want it to go as opposed to just haphazardly with what works. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been very fortunate. I haven't had any injuries in, in uh, 
Oh, actually, last year I had an injury where I couldn't do any weighted chin-ups, weighted pull-ups because my, you know, my elbow, I, I like, you know, strain close to my elbow and the forearm. Right. Um, yeah. And then I had actually I've had wrist injuries, um, so I couldn't really do heavy pressing. But actually, in the year, I've been clean for like a year now, which is great. Um, and so actually, so you know, it's cool talking about the weight and everything, but really, you know, we're referring to lean body mass and that, like that obviously accounts for tracking your body composition. Is there a way that you like to track leanness? Um, I know you use the bo the weight the waist measurement heavily for like aesthetics, which is awesome. I, I think it's like the, the, the best, like one of the best measures of, of overall aesthetics. It's the poor man's anthropometric measure, right? So, I mean, weight, man, weight changes so much. I, and I'm, I'm probably a pound up since when I started drinking this, right? Because the water's got weight. And then... Yeah. You know, and, and Water, not alcohol. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, well, but drinking, you know, depending on how bad you got hammered, the next morning you could actually be dry looking and lean, right? Like it's, or you could look bloated. So it it changes, and then we're lucky as guys. I mean, for girls, it just changes all over the place, right? So it's it's just a on its own, it's a poor indicator of where you're at. Waste is really nice. I find it really predictable. It fluctuates too a bit, but if you do like a fasted morning. Go to the washroom, measure your waist, and you get really good at measuring it. It's it's very easy to assume that roughly an inch on your waist is about five pounds of body fat overall. It just sort of works out that way. Um, it tends to work that way for men and women. Anyone between the height of like, you know, five five and six two, that number tends to kind of hold. So you have that. And then I use you go with the yeah. belt. Okay. Then I use uh, shoulders. Mm -hmm. it, so the circumference, right about armpit level, around the shoulder, around the chest, and across, is a really good measure of just sort of overall muscle mass. Then your neck measurement, this is a really cool one, when you're lean. So for a guy, let's say like sub 12%, for a girl, we're talking under 20%. Large changes, large decreases in your neck circumference is a really good indicator of muscle loss. Right, so you just play with those couple numbers, and then you've got everything you want, right? And then I don't understand why you would train without knowing the rest of it. So if you want a bigger leg, you're either going to be that guy or girl who sits in the mirror being like, yeah, my leg's bigger, or you're going to take out a measuring tape and be like, oh, I've actually gained a half inch on my legs. That program worked, you know, rather than the the memory. Because I mean, my memory, I, I looked like freaking Serge and Gray when I was 26, right? That's how much my memory did. It's not real, right? And so you can't trust your memory. But you can at least look back at some measurements and be like, oh, okay, like my 42-inch like chest when I was in my 20s, that's 16-inch arms, and like my chest is almost 43 on a good day, and my arms are 16 and a quarter. I've actually improved on those measures. And once you have simple measurements, everything kind of comes into play. And as long as you have that waist measurement, everything else makes sense, right? So if I come and tell you, I'm like, Greg, dude, my arm's up to 17 and my chest is a 44. And you go, okay, feel on good job. What's your waist at? I'm like 37. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have gained fat, right? Yeah. If I come to you and be like, hey, you know, my, my arms were up to a 17, my, my, my chest is a 45, like, what's your waist? And I'm like, 29. Then you might be like, all right, I know. <laughs> How's the clan and trend treating you, right? So, <laughs> but it gives you a really good indication. It helps you balance everything out. And I think that once you have those measurements plus weight, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it, right? And once the guesswork is gone, this game becomes pretty simple, right? So your shoulders went up, your thigh went up, um, your bicep, your arm circumference went up, your waist is about the same, and your weight on the scale has been consistently up by about six pounds. Mm -hmm. You've done something right, right? Good for you. Uh, you know, other measurements went up, your waist went down, but the waist, but your weight is the same. It's a good indication that yeah, you've gained some muscle and lost some fat. Like you can, you can really play with those numbers and, and get a good sense of what your body's doing. Once you've done that, especially once you've done it for like a year, a lot of things fall apart. And like the key thing is convincing yourself you're eating for muscle. You know, like okay, I'm gonna take a couple months off this whole dieting thing, and I'm gonna eat to kind of gain muscle. And man, the mirror can lie to you. It can lie because you do, you gain a little bit of fat across the shoulders. You gain a little bit in the triceps. You start looking like t-shirt thick. And you tell yourself, I am gaining muscle. This is, it's finally working. Then you pull out your measurement. Your waist is up by an inch and a half, which means roughly seven pounds. You've only gained roughly five or six. You're like, oh, I'm lying. Right? I'm, I'm, okay, I'm messing with myself here. You know, this is not what I want. So measurements help with everything. And what I like to do, because 
people are going to experiment. You guys are going to try stuff. So I like to say just have some cutoffs, right? So you know your measurements and you know your weight. So I, I normally sit around 174, 175, right? I'm lean at 170, you know, dipping into the 160s, and I'm not lean at 180. So I will try and experiment with anything within that range, and I'll track my measurements. But no matter what, if my waist is going up and I hit anywhere close to 180, experiment's over, right? Or if my arms and legs and chest and shoulders start going down, my waist doesn't really change, and I'm hitting almost 170, 169, okay, well, that whole abbreviated training thing wasn't for me, right? You can really figure things out if you know those measurements. The worst thing you can do is just rely on your weight and the mirror, and that just it doesn't answer anything for you. So just right. take those measurements, and you do wonderful things. Yeah, the, the weight, the mirror, and the measurements gives you the context that you need. Exactly what's going on so this is an amazing point for people to, to to pick up on because if you haven't been taking measurements um, it's so powerful uh, having that that point I do something very similar um, where uh, actually well this this last summer I got my waist down to close to 31 is about 31 and a quarter and five ten. So at, at 510 perfect that's a fantastic waist. it was it was like my waist was tiny I had the veins on the lower abs and uh, and yeah, that was like perfect. And then now I'm up to like close to like 30, 32. So right. I'm, I don't want to let myself go up to like, because I, I used to, when I got up to like 33, that's when, you know, everything falls apart, you know, yeah. uh, for, for me at least. At me at 33, 34, it's like my face gets really puffy and my pecs get droopy and yeah. it's not as aesthetic. Um, so yeah, I'll probably keep myself in that like 31, 32, maybe 32 and a half range. Yeah. For guys or girls, I my, my cutoff is... is Half your height, right? Mm -hmm. So at, at, for a five foot ten guy, seventy inches, thirty five, right? Like you just don't let it go beyond thirty five, right? Like I don't, it don't really care who you are if, if the the waist is thirty eight inches, you can't tell me it's all muscle, mm -hmm. right? Like it's it, it, it's probably not. So and then yeah, when you you know those measurements and the, the key to waist too is I, I the reason I like thirty one and a quarter for your height is that you also start to realize some things. When you start getting smaller than that, um, with, without the help of steroids, the look actually starts to become a bit feminine. Mm. Right? So you, you have these, now you have these cutoffs. You're like, yeah, I don't want to go much lower than 31. Right? And so once you hit that number, you're like, hey, now I'm going to really concentrate on my shoulders or chest or traps or back. You know, you can start working on other things. Is that, go ahead. Or is that because your waist gets narrower than your hips almost? I think so. And you start actually getting a bit of an hourglass, you think. Oh, okay. For, for white guys, I mean, the numbers are slightly different depending on your ethnicity, but for white guys, that tends to be kind of the number where all of a sudden you start doing this kind of thing. Okay, interesting. And if for guys, we measure the belly button. Girls, we measure slightly higher at that really natural, narrow part right below your rib cage. So it's a different measure. If girls try to do their belly button, it messes everything up, right? So it's, it's their, pel like their pelvis or like their hips. Yeah, the exactly. But it, it's, once you know your measurements, the really cool thing about that is I've got measurements from when I was 25. And I'm 37 now, right? So I'm going to be able to track how far I'm falling off when I'm 40 and 47 and 57, and I'll know how far I need to go to get back, mm -hmm. right? And that's that's kind of cool to have that kind of blueprint and roadmap um, going forward, right? Rather than just your weight. I mean, the amount of people who tell me like, I weighed the exact same I did when I was in my last year of high school. <laughs> like, I share with you, right? Like, it's good for you, but I think it's in different spots. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if they could throw up and be like, actually, my waist is the same, my arms are the same, my shoulders are the same, I would I'd be like, teach me, right? Like, you're, you're doing amazing. So it, it really makes it worthwhile. The other thing it does is it helps you from lying to yourself, right? Because there are good mirrors and there are bad mirrors. And every single bad mirror is in a change room in a mall, and the good mirror is at one in your house with the great lighting, right? So you can have a bad day, guys and girls. You look in the mirror, you're like, Oh, they suck. But you <laughs> and you're like, oh wait a second, I'm not that far off, right? Or you hit that mirror when you're like, dude, I don't know what I did last night, but I'm, I think I'm like up 18 pounds of muscle. Like I look amazing. And then you realize the mirror's just kind of bent or crooked. But you take your measurements, you're like, no, get it, got to keep going, right? So they're they're a great well, thing. When you find that mirror, you you keep that mirror and you start. <laughs> It's in the gym. I have the one in the gym. I'm like, this is the best mirror ever. It's going downstairs. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a mirror too in the gym where I'm like, and I don't even look at it until I'm like, I've got like a full pump and I'm like, then it's just done. Then it's done. Oh, man. Yeah. And every once in a while, just for, for giggles, you take the mirror and you turn it this way, and you're like, oh, God. Oh, <laughs> no. 
Yeah, it's one of those ones that's just sort of, it got, I think it got bent up in a move or something. But yeah, so having your measurements is, it's so important because then everything else makes sense, right? When people ask me, like, how many calories should I eat a day? I'm like, you tell me, right? Like, you start start with your measurements, right? Start with your weight and your measurements. And then you get to an amount of calories where your waist is going down and your weight's going down. And I want you to slowly bump those calories up because I want you to eat as much as possible where you're still gaining weight, like losing weight. And you get to a point where it's like, uh, kind of my waist and weight have kind of been the same for a couple weeks. I'm like, okay, take it back down a bit. And you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm losing weight and my waist is slowly going down. I'm like, that's there. You told me. that that's. I don't care what how many calories it is. I don't care the like, what kind of fluids you're eating. Just keep keep doing that. You, you've got it. You've got the magic. You've got the answer right there. And just keep tracking it. And it's going to change because you're going to slightly change things, right? It doesn't mean your metabolism is broken or, or something. Just make small adjustments to track and then keep going. And that's what makes everything else irrelevant is when you know your metrics, you know, everything just sort of kind of falls into place, right? So Greg gets to eat 2,400 calories and to lose weight, and I only get to eat 22. But the key is we both know our numbers, and we make it work, and we know our metrics. So it, it takes so much guesswork out of it that it, it makes it a very consistent, almost mundane process, which is good. Beautiful. Um, that is... That is very well said. I know, um, I guess the last point to add here is like I, I know sometimes when I work with clients and they'll be on the plan for two weeks and their weight will be stuck. You know, maybe yeah. they haven't been eating any carbs and so now I get them eating carbs and I get them strength training. And so they're like, yo, what's going on? I'm not losing any weight. And then we look at their waist measurements and their waist is down an inch and their waist is the same, which is like best case scenario. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's really important because I think a lot of people sabotage themselves because they focus purely on the weight and they don't look at the waist measurements. So they get to the point where Maybe they're, they are losing fat, but the scale isn't reflecting that. And so they get disgruntled, and they try dropping their calories, and that just that just gets them to, like... They're binge. tired and exhausted, and they don't go to the gym, and they eat because they didn't go to the gym, and it's over. Yeah, so um, very cool stuff. Um, this has been an amazing episode. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Um, before we completely wrap up, uh, yeah. is there anything that you're working on now, and where is the best place to go for people to check out all your stuff? All right, so I am I'm active on Twitter. I like Twitter. I like the 144 characters, and I, I'm actually pretty good at corresponding people on that. So, at Brad Pilon. Um, my blog is bradpilon.com. Uh, my book is Eat, Stop, Eat, so eatstopeat.com. And then uh, just generally, those I'm on Facebook, too. I mean, I, I, I try to be accessible. So you have questions or ideas, and I just want to, like, shoot things back and forth, I'm around. So start with those spots. The the blog, just go backwards. There's some you know, so some really good articles or some really far out there articles, but you'll find something you like. And then uh, just in general, I'm on the internet. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, very cool. And it's funny, when I first started fasting, I was I was like unsure. I'm like, should I be really is this gonna really work? And then I was reading your book as I was fasting for the first time five nice. years ago, it must have been. And after I'm like, yes. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. I hope you really enjoyed that podcast um, with Brad Pilon. Now, I actually crafted together a really brilliant survey. Um, you guys can take it at kinobody.com slash survey. Um, and essentially, it's going to ask you some questions to determine really what you need to focus on to take your physique to the next level. It's based on your current body fat level, strength levels, and muscle mass. After you fill it out, um, you're going to fall into basically six different camps, and each one I've created a video pretty much outlining exactly what you need to do, why you've been struggling with this, and uh, really what the next step is. So it's a very cool to take. It's at kinobody.com slash survey. Take the survey, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Uh,